in today's episode. We open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 24. David has a golden opportunity to kill Saul and end his troubles, but he chooses to honor God and he spares Saul's life. But he does cut a bit of Saul's robe off and he struggles with his conscience and he struggles with his men too, who urge him to take matters into his own hands. He later confronts Saul with his kindness and challenges him to repent. Good morning and blessed Pentecost. Today is Wednesday, May 31st, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is brought to you in part by a generous contribution from the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF produces a variety of Lutheran resources in foreign languages. I know, I once took a couple of boxes of their Crayol Small Catechism into Haiti with me. What a blessing to be able to give people a book that points to God in their own language. So you can learn more about all their translating and publishing work and how they can help your ministry on their website at lhfmissions.org. Well, this morning, please join me in welcoming my guest to help us divide and discern and explore 1 Samuel chapter 24. It's the Reverend Doug Gribbenaw pastor and mission advocate at KFUO Radio. Good morning, morning brothers. Hey, hey you're brother. jumping. Jump I, the gun. Well, you know, I've had my coffee today. I am raring to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Um, blessed Pentecost season to you. I haven't talked to you since Judges. Oh, my goodness. We've yeah, we've been a while. It's been a while. I, I well, it does. It feels like no time has passed at all, right? That's the brotherhood of, of the saints. Yes. Amen. Well, I'm grateful to have you on the program again, and especially for this section. It's a good it's a good chapter of the scriptures. We have uh, lots of stuff going on, but this is one of those uh, neat uh, accounts or, I should say, events in David's life. And he's going to have a couple of these where he has the chance to just be rid of Saul. He could take matters into his own hands. Boy, wouldn't life be easy for David if he didn't have the king of Israel on his tail? And yet he, I guess, shows restraint. I don't know if there's any other way to say it. He shows faith in God's timing, and he resists all the peer pressure around him. It, it's a short chapter, but it's it's full of good stuff. And, you know, I, I as I was reading through 24, chapter 24 here, I, I was remembering you know the 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 phrasing that we have at the end of the gospel i believe it's of luke where you know these things are written that you can believe that jesus is the christ the son of god you know this is written all of holy scripture is written for us to to see that the struggles we go through are not unique right we, the christians from time immemorial those who have faith in the christ within the faith of the messiah right we have endured these struggles these temptations uh, since uh, since the fall of our first parents, we're not alone in what we go through in this life. And what a a wonderful example, but also a, a, a wonderful compatriot in our own struggles we see in David, and quite honestly, let's be honest, in in Saul as well. Uh, that, that what we go through in this life, uh, we have we have examples of Christians who have who have not fallen to that temptation to take matters into their own hands uh, and and instead to rest in the Lord and to let his word, his promise to us have its way. I mean, you talk about having compatriots. I think that every leader, every Christian leader anyway, that uh, rises to a position of authority wants to be a David, but sometimes ends up a Saul. And that's, <laughs> yeah, amen. And, and that's us too. We have to be careful because what we see here going on in the, in the scripture, on the ground in ancient Israel, is the reality, right? God's king, his appointed, anointed king, Saul, is not living or ruling as God wants him to do those things. In fact, God's removed his favor from him and put it on David. And yet, the office of king is still highly respected by David. We see that time and again. It's going to be uh, very much on display in today's text. And I think that also teaches us a little bit about how we should respect our authorities, even if they're King Saul's. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, before we dive into the text, though, I'd like to start off in prayer. And of course, as my honored guest, I invite you to start that prayer off for us. Oh, thank you, brother. Well, brothers and sisters, let us pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. 
and we look to your hand for all that we need in this body and life. By your Spirit and through your word and promise spoken to us, let us ever hold fast to our trust in you, our Heavenly Father, that you have worked and shall work and continue to work all things for our good, especially for our salvation and the forgiveness we have in your Son, Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, here we are in chapter 24. Do you want to catch people up a little bit about where we've been, just in case maybe they missed the the last episode? You know, David is, uh, he's hiding, he's going into a city called uh, Keilah, and he try he saves them, <laughs> but then God tells him that if he hangs out there, they're going to turn him over to Saul, and so he's on the run. Uh, anything else you want to add to lay the foundation for what we're going to talk about today? Well, you know, the... David has been on the run, and and he is he's continuing to fight this struggle, the struggle that you and I each day fight between fear and trust, right? Between the old man and the new man. That how many times has David been delivered from the hand of Saul, and yet David continues to then struggle back to to say, oh, but you know Saul's going to get me this time. He's going to get me. It's over. It's done. And and he's escaped. He always going to get me. It's over. It's done. He's escaped. Most recently, they're chasing each other around a mountain. And, of course, David is and his men are, are tremendously outnumbered and tremendously outclassed. But the Lord, through the Philistines, calls Saul away. <laughs> and David is able to escape once again. And so now we find that David and his men are hiding in these very rugged rocks. And as soon as the Philistine threat has ceased, Saul turns his attention back to David. And, and pursues him once again. And so we, we now have David really at this, this, this ultimate engagement now where, you know, if it were a movie, this is the climax of is the hero going to, is he going to go down or, or will he be victorious per se, right? And so this is where we're coming now. And, uh, and because it's a seventh grade movie, right, for seventh grade boys, uh, this all hinges upon a trip to the bathroom, <laughs> And that's it where does, we find indeed. ourselves. <laughs> that's right. Well, we'll talk about that for sure, because uh, that's that's a little detail that if you read too fast, you miss. Um, I'm going to read chapter 24, the first seven verses. Here we go. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all of Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which Yahweh has said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and he stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, Yahweh forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, Yahweh's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is Yahweh's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. So David is in, and his men are in the wilderness of En Gedi. We talked about that a little bit yesterday. En Gedi means spring of the goat, spring of the kid. And it's this, this fresh water spring that's located uh, right there in that wilderness, in the Judean wilderness. It's an oasis. And it's this, he's been hiding in caves and in crevices and going through the mountains. And, and God has brought him to this just beautiful place where I, I imagine they got a little bit of respite from having to be on the run. And then Saul finds him there. And, and you know, Saul is taking 3,000 men out of all Israel to chase after, really, David. Yes, David has, what, 600 guys with him, but really he's just, he's dedicating a lot of, let's say, national security resources to go after this one man. Well, and you know, I, all I can think is that this, isn't that how it always seems, though? You finally have a little bit of respite, and that's when the other shoe drops. <laughs> you know, and I can I can just I empathize with David. Okay, finally, uh oh, on the hill, 
There he is. <laughs> exactly. Dive into the cave. Uh, but you know, the, the thing is that uh, David, yes, he has 600 men, you know, volunteers who, who've you know, stood up with him. But uh, it's 3,000 to 600, uh, five to one. And beyond this, though, the men that Saul has with him are these, are, these are elite guards. These are the best of the best. Um, you know, this is a, you know, a SEAL Team 6,000, right? That's coming after David. So David has, you know, good-intentioned, well-hearted men, probably good, good battle warriors in their own right, but certainly outclassed, outnumbered, outmatched um, by any worldly estimation. And if you were just to look at the numbers, this is the end. David's done. Well, absolutely. And, and you know, he has this mighty force that's going against him. And David, I think he's, you know, he's tempted. He's tempted because <laughs> he's hiding out in this cave, probably because they heard they were coming. And, <laughs> and then... Um, the men, once the opportunity presents itself, are, I guess, twisting God's words, or let's just be fair to them and say misinterpreting God's will and saying, this is it, this is it, right? Because, as it says, Saul went in, and the Hebrew says, and covered his feet. Well, that's an interesting <laughs> word. The English translation re- it says it to relieve himself, but... I, I thought about this, not too hard, but I get what they mean <laughs> by covering one's feet. I get it. You put your 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 clothing down on the top of your feet. Well, and you know what's interesting is the the, the Old Testament. Uh, one of the ways in which a Hebrew idiom speaks of men is is those who relieve themselves against a wall. Uh, you know, because because right. guys can do that. This this covering your feet though this this tells us this this is the. Um, this is the more private bathroom event in a person's life. So he's, he's, Saul is going into this cave by himself because he's, he's doing what we call twosies, right? And, uh, and so he's by himself. He's completely vulnerable, totally exposed. Um, you know, so, so this, this phrase, this idiom, covering his feet is, is for this sort of you're by yourself, you're taking care of your business. Uh, and, and Saul is, is totally open to attack as, as David's men will sort of lead him to, to see. But the thing is that I, in my first thought, I'm always thinking of the cave, and it's like, oh, it's it's a little room, right? And how could all of these men of David and David hide in this? But this is a, this is a very likely a, an extensive network, especially because we're given that phrase, the innermost parts of the cave. So this is a fairly large area, and and really a large area because. The, yeah, you know, there, there's the sheepfold, right? And so we all have seen how large, you know, folds of sheep are. That, that, that there's a, quite a number there. And this cave would be used to, to secure and, and keep safe from, from weather and, and you know, uh, from rain and, and hail and what other storms there are. A very large number of sheep. So it's very possible, in fact, quite plausible that David and his men are able to hide way, way in the back and sit in that total darkness. But it, it's, it's, it's a dangerous position to be in. I mean, you have the advantage of being concealed and hidden, but as we know, most caves you know, have but one entrance. And especially for a sheepfold, you'd want one entrance, one exit. So David and his men are, are absolutely trapped in this cave uh, as, as they're almost now lying in wait for Saul. Well, and there's a little bit of a, a, a comical edge to it, cosmically speaking, because if you if you step back and you look at this, you talked about the movie idea. So here's Saul, and he's got his three thousand chosen men, and he's he's like, you know what, guys, we're gonna go get that David. But you know, just hang on, give me five minutes, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> and he goes in, and if the camera zooms back or zooms up, I should say, yeah, there is Saul exposed before. 600 men, including the guy who's looking to get him. But they say, the men of David say to him, here is the day which Yahweh said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. But here's the problem. That's not, not in Yahweh scripture. <laughs> That's well, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not saying Yahweh didn't give that to him, but we, we don't know about yeah, it. It's not right? recorded. We don't have that anywhere. So are they making it up? Are they twisting the word of the Lord? Because you can certainly use reason to assume 
that David, as the anointed of God, will have his enemies uh, given to him by Yahweh, because every enemy they defeat is a, def is a, is a battle won by Yahweh. But they, they seem like they're trying to say, David, here's our chance. It's so obvious that God wants you to do this because it looks so easy. Well, you know, and I think of first century Israel uh, as, as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, you know, humble and mounted on the donkey. The expectation of the Messiah, of the Christ, was, you know, here he is, he's coming to Jerusalem, and you can almost hear the people of the first century, you know, here is the day which the Lord has said, behold, I will give your enemy, right, Rome, who has, has Israel under its heel, into your hand and you shall do to them as it shall seem good to you. That was the expectation that Jesus was going to go in there, you know, some, kick some tail, take some names and drive the Romans out and restore the glory of Israel there. Uh, and so the, the kingdom would be reestablished. And it, and it's it's not because these are, are wicked unbelievers. And, and in fact, the benefit of the doubt, best construction, right? David's men know that this promise has been given now, that the kingship is David's, that he has been anointed. He is the anointed one who is to be king. And in the sinful flesh, they say, oh, well, instead of allowing and permitting the Lord to to do it in the manner and in the way and in the time that he's appointed. Oh, here's the opportunity. Go over there. You kill this king. You become king. We fulfill what has been prophetically spoken. This obviously is the day that the Lord has given to you to make this all happen. And that's sort of the way that, that our, our sinful flesh wants to make God's word happen. We want to do it. We want to compel it and force it to be and, you know, even in the book of Acts, uh, you know, Acts chapter one, verse six, you know, the, the, the disciples are, are, are sitting there and saying, um, I just need to find verse six here. Hold on. <laughs> Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And, you know, we are wise to hear the Lord's words here and the Lord's word in our own life, too. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority, Right or be patient and rest in the Lord. And, and we have a very hard time, uh, believer and unbeliever alike, of being patient in this world. Amen? Oh, amen to that. And, and, and not only that, you know, again, giving the men the benefit of the doubt, they're presented with this opportunity which they misinterpret as God's will. And how often do we always seem to, when we try to interpret the Bible outside of the way that God has revealed it to us, it, it just tends to go along with exactly how we feel about things, right? I, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me, and wouldn't you know, he agrees with everything that I want to do. <laughs> right. And, and it, it just, it doesn't work that way because, as you said, our sinful nature, and, and we certainly don't need the devil's help, but the devil also uses these types of things to convince us that the sin that we're committing or are wanting to commit is no big deal, right? E either it's God-pleasing because God would not have presented this opportunity. God would not have made you that way. God would not have given you this ability if he didn't want you to do those things. And doesn't mean it's always God-pleasing. Amen. Or, 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 or even perhaps worse, when we start to then sort of justify our sin by saying, but I could have done a lot worse. <laughs> See, this <laughs> is really right just here. a little thing. <laughs> I, I, I don't know why I just thought of this, but when my, uh, when my wife and I uh, were at one of our first places that we lived, the landlady there was charging us a um, pretty high amount, but it was, it was reasonable. And then our electric bill came in, and it was enormous. And to cut a very long story short, we found out that we were paying for the electricity of our neighbor, too. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and that he was told that his electricity was included because we were paying for it. <laughs> and so when we approached her and we said, well, listen, wow, you're, you're charging us you know, rent, but then we also have to pay this high bill. And she says, well, I could have charged you $1,000 a month, but I'm only charging you $400 a month or whatever it was. Right. 
And, and so it's like, well, then by that logic, you could have charged me six million dollars a month. Look at what we're saving. <laughs> One million dollars. Like, that's right. You're right. <laughs> and and that's how we treat our sin, right? This is just a little sin compared. I'm not. A I could have done so I'm much worse, a, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but, having you know, been think, a father, I find that. Uh, I am much, so much like my toddler children, and we adults really are just nothing more than toddlers. We just hide it better, mm. you know, when, when my kids get in trouble. Oh, yes. Well, Dad, I could have <laughs> done this worse thing. All I did was this. I, I could have hit my brother Sam. Instead, I just yelled at him, you know. You, you know, oh. it's funny you bring that up because, you know, the Lord calls us his children, and there's certainly something more significant than that than just being juvenile, but sometimes we're juvenile. And he and he calls us we're we're sheep to his shepherd and you know and I and I think I read online something it was a, an atheist talking about how oh you know how ridiculous to call yourself sheep because sheep are dumb and sheep are this and sheep are that and and while that's not the entire connotation for the sheep shepherd imagery um yeah we, we are that way <laughs> you know we we acknowledge that we don't we are stubborn and we don't do as the, our Lord always wants us to do. And I think in our text here, I think David is convinced. I think David's convinced for a moment Amen. because they say, uh, he'll give your enemy into your hand. You'll shoot, you shall do to him as it seems good to you. So then he arose and then and it's not written in this way, but I get the sense that he arose to do something. And then instead he just cuts off the corner of Saul's robe because as soon as he does that, his heart, struck him but that's also an interesting phrase amen you know and that that the, the his conscience you know it, it, it aches him and it's not just a ooh but it, this is i think that it, what we he is, see is the significance of his trespass because david I, th I think is recognizing that he has he has trespassed the law of the lord uh, in, in really two ways. He, he has taken an action that is against the Lord's anointed, against the king, right? Who, he, who David continues to recognize, you know, the Lord's anointed. This is the king, king of Israel, uh, who to whom I have sworn fealty, right? But more than this, he's also cut off the corner of the robe. And I was thinking back to, to the book of Numbers with the, the corner of the robes have the tassels. And the point of the tassels is to remind the people of Israel of the Lord's commands, of, of his laws. And so David has, has trespassed the law by physically taking God's law into his own hand. So I think there's, there's really a sort of poetic effect of what he's done here and how much it has struck his heart that he has, he's trespassed the law of the Lord and he's taken the, God, the law of the Lord into his own hand and realizes how close he has come to the kind of of self-idolatry that has led Saul to lose the Lord's blessing. He's come so dangerously close to that same uh, dangerous precipice of sin. I think that a lot of people look at this and they go, oh, well, this is just David showing Saul later, which he will do, just how close he came. Look how mercifully as he didn't kill him. He could have because he was so close. And again, David does do those things. We'll read that in a minute. But you're absolutely right. There's a lot more significance to the corner of the robe that he cut. It would have had that tassel, which reminded people of God's law. And this is the in king's way, robe. It's the king's robe, right? So it, it kind of, in a symbolic way, hinders the king's relationship with the Lord because now he's out of compliance. His uniform <laughs> is out of compliance. Um, now, of course, Saul has kind of burned that relationship a long time ago, but still— Saul was still God's anointed leader, and that king's robe is a symbol of his divinely appointed office, the same uh, robe or fashion of robe that David will wear. David will be that king. And so there's also something to be said of if, if David is going to rule in the, under, under the, uh, uh, the appointment of God and expect people to respect that, he has to respect the, the ruler that's currently in place. And, and, and that's really the crux of this whole story is that he, and, and this won't be the last time, but he has to respect the office of the man, uh, the man, uh, sorry, the office, even mm -hmm. if he doesn't respect the man. There, I butchered it, but I think you understand what we, I'm saying. We, we got there. <laughs> and, and, you know, David gets there as well with what he comes back. He comes back from this. 
his heart is aching because of, because he realizes yeah, he's been dancing with the devil, right? He's, he's been entertaining sin. He's committed sin, and now he's coming back, and, and he's giving correction uh, to these men. And, and I love what he says then. The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, or in the Hebrew, the Messiah, right? To right. put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. And so David and, persuaded his men with these words. And it sounds like, again, it was good that we gave them the benefit of the doubt, because if he appeals to the Lord and the men are persuaded, then it sounds like they have faith in the Lord too. Amen. Amen. Though, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge we face each and every day that we don't take the Lord's words and, and even mildly massage them into a validation for our own sinful acts. So David persuades his men they don't attack Saul, and Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Um, we're going to be, this is going to be confirmed in the next verses, which I'm going to wait till after the break to talk about, but it's, it seems as though Saul did not notice, you know, his, his robe or his, his clothing uh, covered his feet. Uh, however, again, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the, the robe obviously is a top garment, but he's able to take this away, cut it away such, in such a stealthy manner that Saul just, well, finishes his business, hops up, you know, and, and leaves the cave. And um, I think that's interesting, too, because I, I don't know if Saul would have known that he would have flipped around and attacked him or done something. But he doesn't. He just. He, yeah, I guess he gets away with it. Well, and, you know, I actually thought about this uh, in, a, in a sort of a practical sense, um, because Perhaps, and, and this was my reasoning, why, why maybe, you know, to, not to diminish the tension of what's happening here, because this is a beautiful scene. I mean, if we were making a movie, this is, this is the, the hold your breath moment. But I'm, I'm thinking sort of pragmatically, you know, if I were going to do, you know, my mm. private business, well, I would, I, as I sometimes do, if I have a suit coat on, right, I take that off and I put it on the hook, right? The kingly robe, I could see, you know, perhaps taking that off setting it nearby but but away from yourself lest it should be soiled and and so david maybe didn't have to get right next to saul like you know breathing down his heel but adjacent to him a little farther away so i i could see you know in a practical sense that the, the kingly robe has been set not far away but a little bit away from saul and, well, I think uh, that makes yeah. uh, I think that makes practical sense, right? He's hanging it on the hook. He doesn't want to get the kingly robe uh, soiled in any way. Yeah, so David's still going <laughs> stealthily, and uh, but yeah. but you know he's not having to be yeah you know, within inches of Saul. Well, ultimately, it shows us that the opportunity to do wrong doesn't you know translate into permission to Amen. do wrong. And we're going to think about that a little more as we take a break. But we're going to come back, and so don't go anywhere, folks. Pastor Gribbenal and I will keep on going through 1 Samuel 24. We'll see you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me this morning is the Reverend Doug Gribbenaw, pastor and mission advocate there at KFUO. 
uh, thank you so much for joining us. I do pray that God blesses you through our study. Thy Strong Word can be heard in St. Louis on AM 850, but also live or on demand at kfuo.org. And if you want to take the show on the road, you can. You can listen to us as a podcast on KFUO's mobile app or on your favorite podcasting platform. And as always, if you want to ask me a question or make a comment, you can email me at pastorboo at gmail.com, or you can find me on Facebook. Just drop in and say hello. Uh, now, Pastor, before the break, I uh, Googled. You know, there's paintings of everything out there uh -huh. in history. And so I Googled painting of David cutting the robe of Saul. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, let's see. Did the artist uh, agree with well, my, uh, my, my thinking? That's, that's what I was going for. And... Um, most of the paintings show Saul sleeping. Oh my! Um, now I know there's a situation <laughs> where where David is, is goes up to Saul while he's sleeping, but I don't recall him cutting his robe at that point. No. Um, there are plenty artistic of artistic license. Of him, <laughs> yeah, there are plenty of paintings of him waving it outside the cave. So like, hey, look at this. And then there is one where uh, he's behind a rock and Saul is sitting in front of the rock and uh, it's draped over the back, but he's still wearing it. So okay, I, fair I, enough. I don't know. We've officially thought about it more than all the Renaissance painters combined. Yeah, right. All the Renaissance painters. Yes, let us. How do we depict one going to the bathroom? Hmm. That's right. <laughs> right? That's right. Yeah. Oh, but uh, back to our back to our text. You know, that's that is kind of where we ended up because. You know, David is has gotten really close, and that's essentially the point of telling us any of this, is that he has gotten very close to Saul. While Saul was distracted, he was sinfully able to cut this tassel or this corner off of Saul's robe, and now we find ourselves with verse 8. And I'm going to read verse 8 through oh, 15. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul. My lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how Yahweh gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put my hand against my lord, for he is Yahweh's anointed. See, my father... Seek the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May Yahweh judge between me and you. May Yahweh avenge me against you. But my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients say, Out of the wicked comes wickedness my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. May Yahweh therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. So, you know, David expresses faith, but he also expresses courage in two ways courage to sneak up on uh, Saul, courage to not uh, take his life into his hands and kill him, right? But he's also showing a lot of courage by popping out of the cave and saying, hey, Saul, look, here I am. I'm the guy you're looking for. But that's not how he does it, right? He, he, he uh, prostrates himself before the king. He pays him homage, and, and he, he tries to plead with him that he really isn't trying to hurt him no matter what he thinks. Well, amen. And 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 also courage then to to trust in the Lord's word and promise to David, to himself. Uh, you know, I'm going to put myself completely open in in a totally exposed and vulnerable place. You know, one one stray arrow from those 6,000 men and it's over for David. Uh, but but he has he has the courage to say that the Lord has promised to me and and so I, I, I confess, you know, I speak what is true to you, King, and I lay myself before, before the Lord's anointed and, and also before the Lord in, in this interaction here between the, the anointed King and the one who is anointed to be King. It's a really dramatic meeting of, of the past and the future, really, of Israel. 
I mean, and he's also appealing to Yahweh, which I think is so important because he says, first of all, you're listening to people who are encouraging you, saying that I'm trying to seek your harm. He says, I'm not. I could have, but I didn't. And that's so true. David never seeks the harm of Saul. Uh, but then he says, <laughs> he calls him the Lord's anointed, which is true. He, he says, my Lord, he gives him uh, a deference in the way he speaks to him. Uh, but then he says something pretty, I, I, I don't know, it, it should have actually been kind of, uh, I guess, rang fear uh, in the heart of, of Saul, because he says in 12, may Yahweh judge between me and you. May Yahweh avenge me against you but my hand shall not be against you. So it's kind of like saying, listen, yes, it's true. I didn't kill you when I could have. I've never sought to kill you. I only want to honor you because you are the king. But at the end, God is going to be the judge. And that's not going to be in Saul's favor. And Saul, in any moment of clarity, would recognize this, that he has just been a, a, a real jerk <laughs> to David. And that's trying to put it lightly. Uh, you know, and, and 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 Saul really ought to recognize that that he has acted um, abusively to David, uh, un, unwarrantedly so, and and the Lord sees and knows this. David knows it. Saul, you know it too. Is really what David is saying. You know, and and you know, vengeance is not mine. Vengeance is the Lord's. Right. That's what David's saying. Well, and, and we also have Saul. Now, do you think that Saul was a, a madman? Do you think he was mentally ill, as we might say? Um, do you think it was just just sinful pride? Uh, I know you're a Lutheran, so you're going to say a little bit of both. But <laughs> <laughs> right. What, 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 I mean, what do you think is the motivate the main motivating factor with Saul? Because I don't want to give away what's getting ready to happen, but he does have a little bit of a, a clear moment where he repents and but he's done that before. He'll do it again. It, it, is this just, uh, you know, indicative of all Christians who have, who can come around, or is this just the fact that sometimes he's lucid and sometimes he's not? Well, you know, I, it reminds me of of another great hero of the faith, um, with uh, with you know uh, Moses before Pharaoh. And how many times did Pharaoh say, okay, yes, 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 fine. I'm, I'm sorry, well, you know, let your people go. And then he reneges on his promise. And in the same way, Saul does the same stuff. Um, you know, he, he, oh, okay, yeah, right. I'm sorry. No. And then he goes right back to it. I think in terms of Saul, it, 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 it's an interesting thing. Because I, I sort of look to try to put myself in, in, in the place of, of all these different people. Because, uh, you know, we are mixes of, of, of saint and sinner. And, you know, when when you just get so uh, upset and angry that you see red or you're so filled with fear that you panic, that you do things that are irrational, uh, that are foolhardy, that are that are selfish, uh, that are wicked. And in, amidst all of this, Saul, you know, there's the fear that that he's going to lose the kingship. And, you know, in a worldly sense, well, that means that he's going to die. And that means that his kids are going to die. The whole line of his house will die. Uh, but then there's also, you know, the, the sort of pridefulness that I will hold on to this. Uh, and, and I will, and I have this authority and this power. I am the king. I can do what I want. So there's the, a tremendous mix of, uh, I think, fear and paranoia and and pridefulness and and this sense of you know, kingly entitlement that that are driving him to do things that in a moment of clarity of that that he of which he would be ashamed and how often do we find ourselves in that as well when when a sin grips hold of us and we engage in in such depravity and then the moment of clarity right you, and you go I can't believe I did that I am I am really to borrow David's words, you know, I'm a dead dog, I'm a flea, I'm, I'm, I'm poo, I'm a bad guy, <laughs> Lord forgive me. You know, that's, that's the life of our Christians. We, we do this, and not to put David in this sort of great light, because David is going to succumb to the same temptations, right? This, this idea of, I have this great authority, I'm the king, I can do whatever I want, and, and we have the adultery with Bathsheba. So it's, 
It is the ongoing struggle of the flesh and, and the new man. Uh, that is, it's the hallmark of our life this side of glory. And that's why we lay in trust in the, God's word and promise. We lay our sins at the feet of Jesus and we ask him to be merciful to me, a sinner. See, I think that's interesting because when we first see Saul, he's hiding amongst the baggage. He's afraid to become king. And I think that is the appropriate and natural reaction. <laughs> Back when we first covered this, I reminded the uh, hearers about the the custom up in Canada, where when the Speaker of the House of Commons is chosen, um, he has to be dragged there <laughs> by the <laughs> Prime Minister and another, I think the leader of something else, but he has to be dragged to his seat. Now, it's all a ceremony now where he's dragged to the seat. Um, so they, they playfully kind of drag him to the speaker's chair. But it comes from a, a, a real custom where you didn't want to be the, the speaker of the House of Commons because you had to give bad news to the king, and mm -hmm. it's a good way to lose your head. And so this guy, he's the king, but is he right? He's the prince of Israel. God still is the king. Mm -hmm. And so he was rightfully fearful to become king of Israel. This is Saul we're talking about. But then that Proverbs... You know, right here, David says the proverb, out of the wicked comes wickedness. I would refer to a proverb that says, you know, power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. And and we see that, right? So now this is, we've come a long way from the fearful, shy Saul who is forced to be king because God has anointed him. And now he's the very powerful, but also very jealous of his power, very paranoid, very a very uh, heavy-handed uh, king of Israel. Uh, and as you rightly pointed out, David's going to struggle with these same things too. I, I think our American romanticism for kings and queens and princes and princesses uh, comes more from Disney than reality because, you know, this is not a great position to be in, to be the leader. Well, and even, you know, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, you know, <laughs> We, we have that idealized, perfect, uh, you know, Christian kingdom. And, and yet when we know these stories, and there's a reason we retell these stories to ourselves, to remind us this side of glory, things are not going to be uh, these idealized things. There is the, the human sinfulness that remains. I was thinking of a, a similar proverb from, uh, from our Lord in Matthew 15. You know, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This defiles a person. Out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Um, you know, so out of out of that heart, out of that that sinful flesh comes these this wickedness, and it's with us all our lives. It's a struggle that we endure. Well, up to this point, every time David encounters Saul, Saul refers to him. Uh, sarcastically, I believe, as the son of Jesse. Mm -hmm. Well, he changes his tune here. We're going to read 16 through the end of the chapter, verse 22. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice, and he wept. And he said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, in that you did not kill me when Yahweh put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may Yahweh reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now, behold, I know that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by Yahweh, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. So, in the same way that, that Saul tends to escalate quickly, um, you know, going from listening to music to throwing spears, <laughs> right? here he goes from a, a battalion of 3,000 men waiting while he's going to the bathroom because they're going to go and they're going to kill that David. And then David just pops out of the cave and, and says these words, of course. And he goes, I'm sorry, you're right. 
<laughs> I mean, obviously the Lord's at work here. We know the Lord's at work. But Amen. but even aside from the Lord being at work, just being a, a bystander, being one of those 3,000 that left, you know, left mama and the kids at home. I got to go on a mission for the king. We're going to kill this guy. We're going to track him down. We've been in the desert for days tracking and asking people and hunting him down and we find him and the king goes oh never mind everybody we're cool now <laughs> right. we're cool I, that just it seems i'm surprised they didn't rise up against saul well you know we, we have two of these these heroes of israel you know, remember the songs that were sung you know saul killed his thousands david killed his ten thousands uh, so you know, I, I think there's still maybe the there there's a um, a hesitancy because you know David, David's the king said we got to pursue David he's a bad guy they've also heard and witnessed David's David's actions I mean even if they're too far away to hear they see that David comes out of this cave where, where Saul just was prostrates himself down making himself completely vulnerable um, I, I I think you know if the king has permitted this one to live well then. Who, who are we to stand against him? And and especially this this one who has been such a hero of the people. So I I can understand you know, the, the these professional soldiers, these elite soldiers, you know, having that uh, that restraint. We'll say. Well, and they're you know they're probably like, well, we're getting paid whether the guy's <laughs> right. or not. Or maybe they're yeah. like, finally, okay, thankfully, Saul. Why why were you doing this? Okay, good. We can all go back to being being happy again, being friends. Well, and that comes up in Second Samuel. I've already dipped into it a little bit with a couple of guests in some pre-recorded episodes. But we, you know, in Second Samuel, after Saul's death, there's this sort of like, you know, okay, we need to get this. And you know, I don't think that everybody, as you said, is convinced that Saul is righteous in what he's doing. They're just being loyal to the king, not that he's got any good. That this is a good idea that he should kill David. So I see your point. I think that they very well may have been sort of relieved. It's like none of them maybe wanted to be the guy who kills the anointed future king of Israel, David, the guy who went up as a kid against Goliath, or as a young man, I should say, against Goliath. Um, so, yeah, your David's fame is spreading amongst his enemies. It's certainly spread amongst the people of Israel. And But it's interesting even the the language that, the, that King Saul uses because— um, he says, for if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? That phrase in and of itself stands out to me because it's almost like Saul is thinking out loud. Like, everybody's telling me that David's my enemy, but if, if I were David's enemy, he wouldn't let me just go. A and so then he appeals to Yahweh to reward him. That's the blessing. But he also gives Yahweh credit for letting David sneak up as close as he did. Amen. So earlier we talked about how, well, it's not God's will that he should use this as an opportunity to kill Saul, and, and David obviously sees that. But God is still behind it all. God still allowed all this to happen. He, uh, he allowed uh, Saul to be vulnerable for a moment. He allowed David to get that close to him, and, and David was faithful, whereas he could not have been. But... Yeah, so even Saul recognizes that that Yahweh is in control, and and you know finally then Saul you know, confesses and he says what's true, the very same thing that his son Jonathan had said just in the last chapter, you know, do not fear for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you, you shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you, right? The, the, and the, and the tremendous love that that uh, David and Jonathan have for one another, what a kinship. And now, you know, King Saul, Jonathan's father, is maybe in a resigned fashion, but also maybe in a relieved way. You know, he says, you know, uh, I know you shall surely be king, and the kingdom of Israel should be established in your hand. But what he says next is what makes me think that there was a, a lot of fear that was driving this this madness, uh, this 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 just insanity to attack David because he then asks David who he knows will be king swear to me therefore by the Lord that you will not cut off my offspring after me and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house I think that's that's this tremendous 
fear, and and that's what he's he's looking for for this assurance that even though he even though he's done this wickedness and has been just a, a, an unreasonably horrible guy to the future king, uh, he asks him not to repay that wickedness. So in effect, David. Do again what you did in that cave, right? Do not repay my wickedness with evil. Uh, do not repay my family for the wickedness that I have done to you. Now, this is, for people who are keeping track at home, is the very first public admission of David's future succession by Saul. It's the first time that he admits publicly that, yes, you are going to be the future king. But you mentioned uh, Jonathan. It's not the first time that we've been told that he knows. Jonathan says back in verse twenty-three, uh, chapter 23, pardon me, verse 17, Jonathan says to David, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. And then he says, Saul my father also knows this. Mm -hmm. So the whole time that Saul is hunting down David, he knows in the back of his head that God has chosen him to be the next, the next king, and 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 so this is just publicly reiterating what he already knows, and we have that similar the similar covenant with Jonathan about not cutting off the offspring too, mm -hmm. and that tends to be his major worry that you know he doesn't want the the sins of the father passed down to his sons, and David is so gracious because he he said okay he he swears this and we see this future benevolence. Um, coming out as we as we read the scriptures, David's going to have opportunities to strike against uh, Saul's descendants, and he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't kill them all. He doesn't wipe out his father's house, or I'm sorry, Saul's house, his well, father-in-law's house. Yeah, his, yeah, his father-in-law's house. Right. That's the aspect we sometimes forget too, right? Because you know they they're pretty close. David's married to uh, Saul's daughter. And, and 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 I love the scripture makes very clear that, that they love each other. I mean, this is not just a political marriage. Like, I mean, David and his wife, they're in love. This is a, a God-pleasing marriage. Well, then the this is not our text today, but the very next verse, and it's worth including, is that Samuel dies. Now, Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. David and Abigail, which comes next, is what we'll talk about tomorrow. But I, just that little transitional there, it kind of it pops back in to remind us that Samuel's still around, but mm -hmm. now Samuel has passed on. He's with the he's with the Lord, as we might say. Um, and all assemble, uh, all Israel assembled and mourned for him. What, uh, in some ways, what good timing for them to reconcile just before? If we're looking at this purely chronologically, mm -hmm. for them to reconcile at least for a brief moment. They're not going to be together. They're not going to be hanging out in the palace together. But at the same time, you know, Samuel, that great last judge of Israel, he dies, and um, and and the whole sort of narrative is brought to a turning point. Yeah, and it, it, and it's it's one of those things where what a wonderful timing, and I think of of how you and I in in this walk of life. We want to be reconciled. Sometimes the way that the Lord works, it, it, it is not possible. Right? Sometimes reconciliation doesn't happen uh, before, before one or the other is, is called home. Or, and, and the thing that I, I, I think here in terms of David is, you know, he was so mistreated and, and so abused by Saul. And, and yet to his credit, he didn't let that that vengeance, that anger, that hurt really take hold and, and lay its roots of, of sin deep in his heart to become a point where, where he hated Saul and, and, and he was overcome with that passion to kill him. You know, that, that he kept wishing to be a good and faithful servant of the, the king and he desired to be reconciled. He wanted things to go back to the way they were. And, and so for you and I and, and, our, and our brothers and sisters out there, you know, we're always seeking and wanting that reconciliation. Guard against that, that hurt and that anger, that fear, that distrust that, that can pervert and twist and, and, and really 
dig its claws into our hearts and always be seeking reconciliation and love. You know, I think of Romans chapter 12, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Um, and 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 seeking seeking that that reconciliation, and seeking that 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 peace that the Lord sent His Son to enact and create in us, right to reconcile us with with the Father in heaven, but then also that we could be reconciled with each other. That is really something for us to to strive toward, and to pray that the Holy Spirit would enable within us, because it's a hard thing to do. I, I to be honest with you, I struggle with that myself quite a bit. Well, amen, brother. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Doug Gribbenaw, pastor and mission advocate at KFUO Radio. Pastor, thanks for being on the show. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Folks, tomorrow we're going to get back together. We're going to talk about David and Nabal, a rich and rude landowner, and we're going to be introduced to uh, Nabal's wife, Abigail, who, uh, well, she has wisdom beyond her husband. And also be sure to tune in on Friday. It's our free text first Friday episode. We're going to have uh, Reverend Frank Rufato, LCMS pastor, retired police detective. He's going to be on talking about how we can minister to the authorities. So don't miss it. That'll be all coming up this week. So until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word.